of safety. Belonging and esteem within a community kind of go hand in glove. Well, they are different, though, a little bit. Belonging is I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the group. You know, I'm not an outcast in the group. I'm a member of the group. Esteem within the community is I'm only a member of, the group, of a group, but I'm kind of working my way up in the pecking order. Is that important to kids? Yeah. yeah. Do they have those needs? Every, every one of these, if you don't, if you say no, that needs not being met, that's all you focus on. So it's really hard to teach math or science or ELA through that incredible need. Uh, do, uh, does K-12 education do a good job of those levels three and four there? Yeah, we try. It's really hard. It's really a tricky thing because you can't always see it. Uh, if you had my um, middle granddaughter, Aida, uh, and all my grandkids go to public school, you know, my kids, uh, all my kids have gone to public school by design. And you know, Aida's quiet, and, you know, and she just won't cause anything. She's bright and she's funny, and, uh, but, uh, and I try to spend time with my grandkids uh, in, uh, individually as much as I can. Uh, not as much as I should, obviously. But uh, I was with Aida, this is a few years ago, she was in middle school. Uh, and uh, she was upset. I said, what's going on, honey? And she told a story about, she, you know, that middle school little clicks, and she had talked to the wrong boy or something like that. And I'm thinking, oh, that's in that sweet, that little middle school romance stuff they have. And then she started crying, and they said, they have shunned me. And I thought, oh my God, this is no little you know, quirky thing to her. That's her whole life. You know, they have shunned me. So that need, she was in the group. Well, actually, she was shunned. She was thrown out of the group. Just a huge need. So you almost can't go wrong focusing on that. There's always kids who, by definition, all of us need it. We adults need it. Now, K-12 education, I think, does a decent job of the first four. At least we're very aware of it. We try to do our best. The next two, we don't. And that is self-actualization, a connection to something greater than self. And these are the big motivators. If you have kids who are self-actualized and connected to something greater than self, that's when you don't have to tell them to do something. So here's what self-actualization is. That's when they're working on things that they really want to work on. Okay. Now, here's the tricky part. When they're little, it might not be math or science, okay? They might want to be a football player or a basketball player or whatever it is. So one of the things we'll, we'll have in the academy, every year, every student will be working on a long-term project of their own design. You know, we have to figure out how to build it in. You don't do it every day. I'd like to see it once a week in some type of homeroom situation. You know, we, I, actually, we get the best results when the teacher engages in that too. So, well, here's my goal for this year. I want to you know, run a marathon, or I want to take a vacation, you know, this summer, whatever it is, and they're constantly working on it. You're sharing yourself, you know, and all the ups and downs and the inspiration, hopefully, that comes from that. Uh, you get that going, you know, and you've now started to, you know, flip a switch for kids, and you don't know when the effect will truly show up, but it's there. Uh, uh, I get passionate about this one because I've seen it in my own family so powerfully. My uh, oldest, my 49-year-old son, was a non-academic in school. Uh, he uh, just, I mean, he learned to read very late. You know, the only book, when, when he graduated from high school, the only book, he, had, he, he was good with cars. So he liked gas engines <coughs> and cars and motorcycles and stuff like that. And he was really intense on that stuff. And he, would, he and his buddies would work all night tearing an engine apart and so I mean, they were intense. They really were, but just non-academic. When he graduated from high school, the only book he had ever read was The Mouse and the Motorcycle. That was it. <laughs> that was his one book. At least he picked the classics. You know. the, uh, and he was counseled not to go to college. He said, you're not, I drove me nuts. My wife had to like restrain me. You know, he says, stay out of it. You know, don't, I was going to go to talk to a counselor. Said, what are you doing? You can't say that. But he didn't have the grades for it. He agreed, said, Dad, I'm not academic. Uh, he had a, uh, he wanted to be a mechanic, and I said, if you're going to do it, do it well. So we, uh, we had the diesel school picked out that he was going to go to. And I said, just if you're going to be a mechanic, be the best mechanic you can. He wanted to race top fuel dragsters. He was even on the crew of a top fuel dragster at age 14, which I think was illegal, but he you know, did that. <laughs> the, uh, and I said, you know, just do it. If you're going to do it, go for it all the way. I'm, I'm behind you. And they all changed when he saw the movie Top Gun. Remember? Ever seen the movie Top Gun? Uh, he said, I want to be a fighter pilot. And I said, really? He's, he's, he said, uh, yeah, is it possible? I said, you bet it's possible. So you know you've got to go to college, but do it. I'm behind you. He actually swore me to secrecy. I couldn't tell his mom, his sisters. You know, it was such a you know, weird dream. Well, that got him out of high school. He had to go to a community college, make about a year of school. Uh, he then entered University of Colorado Aerospace Engineering because that was the best degree to have to be a pilot in the Navy. Graduated with honors, went into the Navy, and flew F-18s for 20 years. 
okay, actually graduated from Top Gun uh, and uh, became an instructor at Top Gun. Just a great career, commander of a squadron, the whole thing. Uh, so once he got excited about that goal and even had a little bit of success, I remember he would set yearly uh, goals for his grades, hated academics, but he said, I got to get a good grade for this. That just, you know, drew him his whole life, it really did. And after 20 years in the military, you can retire and have a pretty good retirement. So he, he unfortunately was deployed a lot. He was away from home, very, very dangerous missions that he was on. He had 20 years, said, Todd, you've done it. You know, retire, lead the good life, go fly for United and see your family. And he's, uh, but the Navy threw a monkey wrench into it. They selected him to become commander of an aircraft carrier. Now they do that to six people a year. And you have to sign up for another nine years. And two of those years are nothing but books. You know, he just hates books. And I said, Todd, you don't have to do this. And he said, I think I'm supposed to do this. Now that's the important part of the story. I think I'm supposed, it was he said, no, I want to give back. And I've developed a certain level of, I think it's my turn now to do something that kind of helps the bigger cause. So as I speak, he just uh, finished a tour as, you know, an executive officer is number two in command of the USS Nimitz. And prior to that, he was executive officer of the Lincoln, and next December, I'll take over his own ship. Now, I like to tell, I can brag about my own kids, obviously, but do you get the point? Mm -hmm. You know, as you go up the hierarchy here, you become more, it's more and more intrinsic motivation. Uh, so here's what you could say, that um, metaphorically, every kid in every classroom, actually every human being, but it's more, more for kids because they aren't as formed as we are in terms of the world and where we fit into it. Uh, they're asking these questions, questions. Is this situation comfortable from a physiological perspective? And if they get a no, that's it. You know, that's what they attend to. Is the situation safe? Am I welcome in this situation? Do I have a sense of status in this situation? Does this situation allow me to move toward a personal goal? And does this situation inspire me? That's actually the most important, important part of the academy. I want to make sure we operate from that, formally and informally. So they ca it should be, really should be a place where kids are inspired. And there's part of the curriculum that, that addresses that, at least once a week, inspirational stories. You know. mm -hmm. That might come from you know, Rebecca, right out of her office, where here, a story. From the community, bringing in people to come in and talk about what they've done. Individual classroom level, you can do that. Stories that you've heard. Now we have resources. What's really great, there's so many resources to this end that are, that are out there. Every year, every kid is working on their own personal project. You know, so I want that, really. You're not inspired every day of your life, but imagine going to a school where at least once a week there was something you went, wow, that's really neat, or I could do that. You do that for enough years, and you've counteracted you know, some of the negative messages that kids get from the media, and you know better than I, in some homes they don't get a whole lot of positive, in some homes they do get a whole lot of positive, you know, but a school should be a place that there's a steady diet of that. So that's the general model. That's it. And actually, even though we'll focus on the knowledge system, we've got to do a good job there. The more important systems are the cognitive, the metacognitive, and the self. And that's what makes the academy the academy. You know, when kids are asked, what'd you like about this? Hopefully there's something, and they'll say, I like that part where I got to work on my own project. I like the part where they told me. So I got to, uh, like the part where I got to meet people from the community who had done incredible things. Uh, I once heard somebody say, with most schools, you could draw, if you do a radius, I forgot if it's a half mile or a mile, I forgot. So let's say a mile, you know, on the conservative side. Now, in, any school, most schools, actually most schools in the country, if you do a mile radius around the school, you could find stories of people who have done things that are absolutely amazing. You know, that haven't been told to anybody but their families. That's when it's really powerful. You get, you get people from the same culture, you know, kids look at and say, I, you know, he or she, they come from kind of my background too. You know, that's really, really powerful. So, I want to uh, take, give you a few minutes just to react to that. That's the big picture <coughs> without the details. Those four systems will do knowledge, but will also do the other ones too. Just at your tables, react to that. Good idea, bad idea, it can never work, it can work, it excites me. <laughs> what makes them the leader of what they, of what they want to be? Yeah, very concretely, you're going to see. Students have a lot of 
opportunity and responsibility in terms of their own learning, demonstrating their own learning. You know, it's a real shift. You know, although the pieces are going to be, uh, the, they're pre pretty straightforward. I mean, there's nothing I'm, we're going to show you. Oh my God, where'd that come from? I mean, it's been, no, <laughs> it's been out there. But putting them together, you know, actually with this bigger frame in mind, with the idea of that you want, we want to uh, to um, develop their s their sense of agency, their mm -hmm. self agency. You know, and that's different. That's a real shift. It really, it takes a while. It's not going to happen the first day. Uh, the part about inspiration, I mean, that's, that for me, that's absolutely huge. For you and me, too, it's got to be there. Mm -hmm. No kidding. So one of the, my commitments to people who teach in the academy is relative to your goals in terms of your profession, we'll, we'll help you get there, okay? We really will. I'll talk about there's a thing called the high reliability school certification. The school will be going through. There's a thing called the high reliability teacher certification. Yeah, you know what national school board cer certification is? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is an alternative to that, which we just started. Uh, now, it, now, it's not a simple certification, but working in this school, you will have all the resources available to that, all the data. It takes about two years to do. Completely, you know, you don't have to do it at all, but if you want to, what I'm trying to do is create a network of teachers across the country who are experts in this pedagogy, you know, and that's and it's formal. It's a certification. You get the certification, become part of a big network. So, should be for your own professional. I'm sorry, can't help you with your goal of being a millionaire or you know, <laughs> going on a great vacation. But we can relative. You say I want to be a superintendent. Good. Let's make this experience be something that you know guides you to. I'm dead serious about that. I'm just dead seri serious about it. Uh, uh, okay, that's it. Uh, so uh, we won't take a break. I want to give you the details. But if you don't like that part, after break, go to Rebecca. <laughs> <and> <laughs> give her your name tag. <laughs> I'm going home. This is, we'll sign up for this stuff. Uh, yeah, because it'll be in the beginning, starting a new school. We, we took a tour of the building, which was really exciting. But I kept, as we walked around, I said, I'm glad I'm not Rebecca and Rashid. <laughs> Instead of saying, <laughs> Good God, the level of detail that they have to deal with. Have you, see, have you seen the site? Yeah. It's really beautiful, but, but oh my God. So, so I'm looking at, you know, it, oh, what, what's it going to look like? And poor Rashid and Rebecca are looking at, oh my God, the lights aren't in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Where does that wire go? And that, are they, oh man, I can't imagine what they're doing. Okay, so be nice to Rebecca and Rashid. Very, very, very nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, let me go into some of the specifics now. So that content piece, I had said we wait, try to teach way too much. We're going to be very, very focused. Uh, and we're focused using the work we've done. We call it the critical concepts. We've identified those topics in math, science, ELA. Uh, we're, the last one, is, we're doing social studies. So that, 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 that'll be the last side of the game because we have to include you know, uh, Nevada State history. Uh, we've also got the cognitive skills. We've got the metacognitive skills. We've got technology. Uh, one, one piece that will be part of the academy is coding. You know what I mean by coding? Yeah. yeah that, uh, so everybody, all kids are going to have coding. Not a whole class on coding, but just the opportunity to code. Uh, the main reason for that is to reinforce metacognitive skills, particularly one. Uh, called looking for cohesion and coherence, making sure all the pieces, co there's two things, two, two things we ask students to do uh, that uh, are great teachers of cohesion and coherence. One is writing, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. See, when you write, you gotta step back and say, wait a minute, does this all go someplace and do all the sentences kind of point to that place or am I, you know, going all along? But the problem with writing is it so, takes so long to get feedback. Has anybody done any coding? You know what I mean by coding? It's frustrating, right, and exhilarating when you get it to work. So what's really cool about coding is all this, you know, all, all this, you know, these programs that are out there that are free, but the kids are actually creating something that works on the spot. It's interesting, you talk to people who are coders. Uh, Khan, the Khan Academy, mm -hmm. uh, and Solomon Khan, I, I saw a tape of him and he said it was coding that changed his life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes you think in a, in a systematic way. Now, I'm an old coder. You know, I used to code in a, a language called Fortran. I remember just thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. You can write these little things down and the computer does that. So there'll be technology, you know, we'll have math, science, science language, our social studies, uh, uh, the cognitive, the metacognitive skills. We don't have 
proficiency scales for the self system. That's something that's going to be us making sure they uh, have opportunities for self regulation, for uh, uh, self actualization uh, and connection to something greater than self. So it's a little hard. Yeah, it's kind of tough because you get into beliefs. Make sense? And it's, a, it's one we have to tread lightly. We can't, we, you know, we can't impinge, uh, impose on their belief systems, their family's belief systems. Because really, at the top of the self system are these, you know, beliefs we have about the world and life, you know, and what happens when you die. That's all part of the self system. And those, are those important motivators for kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we go in there? No, we really can't, you know. But what's nice now, with social emotional learning, uh, becoming so popular, you almost automatically at least have to realize that that's going on in the student. They've, they've got these beliefs, and those beliefs are very, very important to them. Uh, the, uh, so, you know, we'll make sure we don't tread on, you know, do anything inappropriate, but also just acknowledge. They've got these theories of what the world is like and where they fit in. By the way, at what age do kids really start thinking about those big picture ideas? Uh, I mean, like, what's it all about? And, you know, at, what, at, at what age do they have a sense of mortality? Do they really, they really get it? I actually, some people go lower than that. I've heard as low as four. Okay, not all the time. I saw it happen with Jacob when he was six. Now Jacob's my oldest grandson, and uh, I got a call from Carmen. It was a Friday night. She said, uh, "She said, Papa, I'm going to come over." I said, "What's wrong?" She says, "Jacob's just beside himself." Um, I said, "What's going on?" She said, "I'll tell you." So he gets there. And now he had seen. I forgot what it was. I think it was like a puppy was run over or something like that. Now. The, uh, now, he knew the concept of death, but it never, mm -hmm. it, all of a sudden it was real. Mm -hmm. And he started saying, Mom, am I going to die? And she says, Jacob, yes, but that's, we all die, but that's yeah. years and years and years away. Don't worry about that. Are you going to die, Mommy? Yeah. Yes, uh, that's years. <laughs> but I guess she said, he said, is Papa going to die? And yes, but I, years and years weren't. <laughs> 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 so I think, it's, let's get over there before the old guy's <laughs> not around anymore. Uh, but he was just, uh, I've got a great relationship with Jacob, uh, and so he came over, and, uh, and he was crying, and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is a six-year-old dealing with that. Yeah, and I actually kind of remember my own life, when, it was, when did that kind of hit? Yeah. Now, we can't go there. We can't talk about you know, our, you know, our beliefs individually, but in my family, I could. I said, Jacob, here's what I believe, you know, and that was very, very comforting to him. You know, so that, those, those dynamics are going on. We can't get away from it. Content, that's very, very straightforward. Um, the, uh, we'll have a focused curriculum for the cognitive and metacognitive skills. I'm going to go over these later. We'll have a set of cognitive skills. You know, it's slightly different than that. I've added a few things in terms of proficiency skills. That's, that'll be part of the curriculum. I'll go over some of the things later on, you know, give you some strategies. And there are strategies for each one. Okay? They won't be taught at every grade level. That's what we'll have to figure out. At what grade level do we do this? At what grade level do we do this? Uh, uh, what do we use to assess? These aren't paper pencil things. These are things that's more in practice. Do students do a lot of self-evaluation? Uh, metacognitive skills, that'll be our list of metacognitive skills. Setting goals and monitoring progress. Staying focused when answers to solutions are not immediately apparent. Important, important skill. You know, some, some kids in this day and age don't realize that that's a skill. It's like, if I don't have the answer, I'll go on to something else because I'm clearly not skilled in this area. This is growth mindset stuff. It really is. If you don't have the answer, welcome to the club. You know, we all run into that. Now, what do you do? Stay in there. Hang in there. That's the skill. That, not knowing the answer, that's the skill. Resisting impulsivity, important one. If you look at these, you start going, oops. <laughs> 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 Write that one down. <laughs> You're supposed to not be impulsive. Who said that? Uh, you get the idea. So I'll just this. Um, so let me start going into specifics with arguably the hardest part or the part that's the most different, at least in some people's mind. Proficiency scales. 